So uh, last week, uh, started giving you a little bit of an overview of what I uh, learned when I was back in Kentucky at the Answers in Genesis Pastors Conference. One of the speakers that I mentioned, Michael Ferris, was not a planned speaker, but uh, he filled in at the last minute and it, it was a real blessing. And he recommended several resources and anytime someone gives me an excuse to buy a book, <laughs> I'm down with it. I love books. Uh, Tony Hartford and I are part of a 12-step group. Um, there is required reading. Um, but uh, I, I was talking to Tony about I just did a cursory glance at my books at home, not even the ones in my office, and I would have to live to be about 475 years old to, to read all of them if I read one a week. Now, you guys, there's different styles of readers. There's, well, people who read and people who don't. Um, how many of you love to read? How many of you loathe to read? Okay, a couple of honest people. All right. Um, but pictures, you like books with pic lots of pictures? You don't even like pictures. When you have to do a book report, do you try to see if it's been made into a movie? Yeah. Oh, wait, only one book you've actually read? The Bible and To Kill a Mockingbird. Those are two good books. Uh, <laughs> have you seen the movie To Kill a Mockingbird? Okay, all right. Anyway, one of the books that Michael Ferris recommended, and I mentioned it last week, is this one here called The Great Dissenter. And uh, it's on the story of John Marshall Harlan. And most people have no idea who John Marshall Harlan was. Uh, but Harlan was a Supreme Court justice for 37 years. And he's, the book is called The Great Dissenter because he really was the father of dissent. Uh, up until Harlan, the court had a tendency to rubber stamp things, and, and if you did dissent, you, you, you didn't say anything about it. Harlan felt passionately about several causes. Here's one of his quotes. He said, our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. This particular quote, in fact, I'll give you the following quote, another quote, the thin disguise of equal accommodations for passengers and railroad coaches will not mislead anyone nor atone for the wrong this day done. This was part of his dissent. Some of you are good history buffs and you know what this dissent is from. It was a very famous and very consequential Supreme Court case. Anyone know which one? Plessy versus Ferguson. Plessy versus Ferguson stated, the majority stated, it gave us this idea of separate but equal. What a load of fertilizer. And Harlan, in his lone dissent, he was the only justice that, that dissented, wrote that, the thin disguise of quote unquote equal accommodations for passengers and railroad coaches will not mislead anyone nor atone or make up for the wrong this day done. <clears throat> Plessy versus Ferguson was consequential and this country paid dearly for decades and continues uh, to pay for this horrendous uh, decision. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> now, John Marshall Harlan may have had you know, our, our, our lives influence how we view things and the experiences we've had in lives. And it may have been his brother that had a major influence. There are no photos of his brother. There is a sketch. Um, and his name was Robert Harlan. Now, it's hard to tell from the, the sketch, but 
Why J John Harlan may have been uh, very sensitive to this issue is because his brother Robert was, uh, was half black. Um, now, he could have passed as a white man, but Robert Harlan decided not to. And uh, he and his brother were very close, and so I think that did have an influence on John Harlan's decisions. But uh, Robert Harlan was uh, actually was a very successful uh, individual. It's unknown to historians uh, who, about his parentage. Uh, there's some that think that John Harlan's father is Robert Harlan's father. That's what most historians believe. Some think it was uh, John Harlan's grandfather that was the father. Um, Robert Harlan's mother was a slave, and sadly that wasn't an unusual occurrence uh, at that time. Um, but Robert Harlan was, uh, by the way, they were both from Kentucky, so there is a Kentucky connection there. Robert Harlan went to England and introduced horse racing to the British, at least American-style horse racing. So that, I'm sure that was significant in British history. Um, but Harlan also was successful in, in mining gold, and he, he had, was an entrepreneur and, and had his hand in a lot of different things. But he spoke very passionately about education and making sure that all children, regardless of their ethnicity, had a good education. And it's in this context he said this, that referring to the education of all children, then would the noble martyrs of our cause not have died in vain, and human slavery would evermore be an impossibility. He felt if people knew the truth, then they would recognize the evils of slavery. John Marshall Harlan, when he died, he had a lot of fans, one of them being Frederick Douglass. And Frederick Douglass called him a moral hero upon his death in 1911. So that's some of the, uh, these aren't, that isn't stuff that I learned at the conference, but uh, I haven't finished this book. By the way, I'm one of those book readers, I, it, I'm what you would call an ADHD book reader, in that I usually have about 12 books I'm reading at the same time. By the way, when I say the same time, I don't mean I have them all open and I'm going from one to another, although that would, I might try that. No? But I'll read a book and then sometimes I, I get bored or distracted and so I try something else. Like the Bible. The Bible is an excellent distraction. Well, before we continue, uh, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and then we'll go back to the conference. So. Father God, thank you for the truth. Thank you that you are truth, that you give us a solid foundation of that in your word. We can trust in scripture. We can trust that it is your word. Help us to study your word, apply your truth to our lives, and to proclaim it to others, to be bold and stand up for our faith, recognizing that we are surrounded by evil in this world. But Lord, you have conquered evil. You are continuing to uh, uphold truth, and we need not back away from it. Thank you for loving us always, and thank you for loving us ultimately, that expression that you uh, gave us through your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray these things, amen. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry about that. <coughs> I forget, you're supposed to cough into your elbow, but when I do that and have a microphone on, it just amplifies things. So anyway, I'll just cough out here and then just stay away from that germ-ridden portion of carpet. All right, as you know, I was out in Kentucky. Technically, it's a Williamstown, Kentucky, a town of about three people and 9,000 horses and an equal number of distilleries. There's moonshine in them hills, let me tell you. 
So the conference was at the Ark Encounter, uh, the Answers Center, which is a separate building. It's not in the Ark, but it's near the Ark. So if it started raining, you could get there quickly. Um, although they do point out uh, that that Ark won't float. It actually would, in theory, float if it weren't for the fact that they have to have, uh, you know, there's holes in the back t for extra structure for bathrooms and things to meet fire code. So I don't think Noah's Ark met fire code. Um, actually, it probably did, because the Lord is, is perfect in how he does everything. So uh, if you weren't here last week, just very quickly, that was our, who led most of our worship. Of course, Ken Ham uh, spoke, uh, Emil Zwain, and this is before all the war broke out in Israel, and so he's Lebanese, so he, I think, would have had an interesting perspective um, on uh, world events. And uh, I should have taken the animations off of here. Philip Webb is a very interesting looking guy, uh, but he's a tenor, operatic tenor from the Masters University, which is John MacArthur's, uh, connected with his church, Martin Isles, and uh, his uh, message, uh, James Coates, if you recall, is the pastor who was jailed, a Canadian pastor who was jailed for refusing to uh, closed down his church during COVID. Uh, Daryl B. Harrison uh, was one of my favorite speakers and uh, had a lot of good things to say. And Colonel Jeffrey Williams, up there he is. Um, yes, he was an astronaut and uh, just an amazing presentation. Mike Johnson, interestingly, I didn't really know who Mike Johnson was, was scheduled to speak and that was, uh, but that was the Tuesday that the House had to con convene to oust, ended up ousting uh, Kevin McCarthy as Speaker of the House, and so he couldn't speak. So Michael Ferris filled in, whom I mentioned earlier, and uh, that was part of the gala. And then the next day, uh, Mike Johnson, but, but notice Mike Johnson's, the title of his speech, Fight Like a Christian Contending for the Faith in an Increasingly Hostile Culture. He had no idea that week that he would become Speaker of the House uh, this, just a few days ago. Um, and then, like I said, Michael Ferris filled in for him. Michael Ferris is his mentor. Michael Ferris headed up the uh, American, wait, uh, ADF, Alliance Defending Freedom. I started saying Anti-Defamation League, but that's an entirely, entirely different organization. But he talked about the pro-life movement and just Christianity in, in general, but how you have to sing the right song. Is your message based on truth? But he used kind of the analogy of a, of a hymn and that you want to sing the song sweetly and that it's pleasant to the ear. You also want to sing the song boldly and not be fearful of what the truth is, and then sing it faithfully. I think a lot of people in the church have shied away from speaking up for their faith. And why? You know? Do we fear that somebody's going to not like us anymore? You know, you not speaking the truth isn't going to make you make them like you anymore. So just be who you are. But again, don't forget the first one of singing the song sweetly. We can be bold in our truth, in his truth rather, <laughs> um, and yet still be pleasant. Christians often come across as jerks. Why? Because sometimes Christians are jerks. We don't need to be. Now, I, uh, yeah, I'll get to that. So, and, and re regarding abortion, Ferris uh, most recently was co-counsel uh, on the Dobbs decision, and he said that the goal is not that abortion be just reduced or banned, but unthinkable. And that goes back to what the Harlan brothers believed in, that you need to, we need to communicate the truth, communicate it effectively, and in a way that still shows compassion. Um, and let God worry about the consequences. 
Uh, Phil Johnson was one of the, was a Thursday speaker. The noetic effect, sin makes us stupid. I think we all know that. And then of course, uh, Ken Ham finished out with Martin Isles, the end of the conference, a reminder that we are the light of the world. Um, so if we go back to Mike Johnson, who obviously, again, did not know what the Lord had in mind for him, getting my, my phone. Why am I getting my phone? Because screen caps are the greatest thing ever because I'm kind of lazy sometimes and rather than have to, you know, type everything up, it's just, it's just right here. How many of you heard Mike Johnson's acceptance speech before the House? Um, it caused quite a stir because he did something that's been kind of unthinkable for quite a long time and that is he spoke of God and the Bible. He even almost quoted scripture and actually did something remarkable, remarkable for a politician in that he quoted it correctly and contextually. So there were some, uh, there were definitely some opinions on what Mr. Johnson had to say. Well, and here's, and, uh, uh, here's some of the things that he did say. He, so he said, I don't believe there are any coincidences in a matter like this. I believe that scripture and the Bible is very clear that God is the one who raises up those in authority. He raised up each of you, all of us. And I believe God has ordained and allowed each one of us to be brought here for this specific moment and this time. This is my belief. Now, I think he said that if we go back to Ferris's recommendations, there wasn't anything mean, rude, and he even at the end said, this is my belief. So that respected everyone else's beliefs. Like, you don't have to believe it. I believe it. But he also sp spoke it boldly and faithfully because he has continued to have that message. And as I mentioned uh, Wednesday night uh, on our Zoom prayer meeting, he put a bigger target on his back than there already was. Because he's the third most powerful individual, if you look at our hierarchy in the United States, right behind the vice president and the president. So he's third in line of secession. And uh, he also said, I believe that each one of us has a huge responsibility today to use the gifts that God has given us to serve the extraordinary people of this great country, and they deserve it. So again, a lot of people loved him for that. Uh, a few other folks, not so pleased with it. Uh, psychologist Lucia... Grassaro said, when a country is ruled based on religious principles, you get the extremism that managed to survive through the millennia. Irrational beliefs should not inspire social policies. Mythology is to be studied, beautiful field, but has no active place in modern societies. She added, what if some politician somewhere would start proposing we all go, all go by Apollo's principles? It's the same for any other religion that made it to this day. What? Anyway, there were a lot of other nasty comments uh, made about, about Michael Johnson. Now look, he's not the savior. No politician is going to save the United States. 
And if the United States is going to have true revival, it's not Mike Johnson or Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, or anyone else in Washington, D.C. It's you. We're the ones that will make the difference as we let God work through us, as we learn to sing the song sweetly and to sing it boldly and faithfully. So don't give up, don't give in, don't be discouraged for long. <laughs> um, God is on his throne. He hasn't moved an inch. And if you pray for opportunities to proclaim the gospel, he will give them to you. And as he gives them to you, don't ignore them. Don't think, well, I don't know. Lord, you need to give me a sign. Well, one may just fall on your head. And then when you meet him face to face and ask him, wait a minute, why did you call me home? It's like, because you were doing me no good on earth. Might be the worst thing, wouldn't it? To be face to face with our Savior and have him say, I called you home early because you were not effective. Instead of, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now, how many of you are called to be missionaries? All of you are. Now, it doesn't mean you may, you may not go to a foreign country. Some of you have been on short-term missions trips. We never did get to hear Julie's report. So why don't you come up right now and you can give it. You could if you want. You don't have to. We'll schedule another time, all right? Because we'd still love to hear uh, what the Lord did in, in your life and, and others. You went to uh, Puerto Vallarta. Where did you go? No, I, kn I knew that. But we're all, we all have a mission field. Um, many churches uh, put that over their doors as you leave. You are now entering the mission field. A reminder that we are always on mission for the Lord. We always ought to be. So... What else did I learn? I didn't learn anything, except that I still, Kentucky has much better barbecue and catfish. Oh, so delicious. One thing I appreciate about the Ark Encounter was the, 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 the surrounding environment. The landscape is beautiful, and it celebrates God's creation. In fact, they have a rainbow garden, and so they have plants of all different colors. And uh, it's, it's really pretty amazing. This is just a view of, that's an odd photo because it was taken at like nine o'clock at night, but it came out very well. But it's of a planter kind of looking down on it. These planters were about this tall. Anyway, so there's the ark, more ark. And like I said, the surrounding uh, landscape is, is really quite nice. And Kentucky's weather lends itself to uh, you know, that kind of a landscape. It'll all die, probably is dead now, but... Um, now, some of you have been to the Ark Encounter, but I, I like how they, you know, they, un they explain right off the bat that they take some artistic license because, let's face it, the Ark, we're not given a lot of detail about what it looked like, um, you know, and Ken Ham is passionate about it not looking like a, uh, a, a cute little cartoon arc with happy little animals. Um, he did say at one time, I don't know if he was being completely serious, but that if he came in your church and he saw cute arcs on your walls, he would rip them off. Um, so that's where they kind of, with a lot of you know, experts, came up with sort of that shape. Because you know, then there was a movement where the people had the ark as just a big box. Um, but when you think about it, a box doesn't make sense uh, as far as how it would you know, manage. Because the, the ark didn't need, God did the navigation, um, but just a big box would, be, would float around randomly and, and would capsize easily. And you consider how violent the flood was uh, with the waters coming down and coming up. Uh, it needed to be something that would be stable. And so that's, you know, this is their best guess. They acknowledge that it, it doesn't mean that that's what it looked like, but 
Um, in any event, interior, the same thing. So here they're showing, you know, small uh, cages, and you can see the, well, I guess it's harder to see up there than down there. Uh, um, but kind of on the right of each cage, there's a, a, a clay, you know, uh, vessel for water and, and bins for food. But it's, it's fascinating. Uh, there's some really cool views when you can look all the way through the arc, and the way they designed it is pretty amazing. They also did these dioramas, so, um, that are really well done, kind of showing what led up to God needing to send a flood. So the things that were going on in Babylon, they had a real challenge in determining what to show. Because the debauchery that was going on was, you know, rated X, or NC-17, I guess, would be the modern equivalent. But um, So how do you depict that, but not be too graphic? Uh, and yet communicate what was going on, the, the, the sin that was going on. What I didn't know, I found this out uh, watching a, a video on Answers TV, is many of the characters in these dioramas are modeled after Answers in Genesis staff. <laughs> <laughs> and so they all got their little, their little cameo in there. And uh, so I thought that was kind of, kind of cool. So again, uh, these different, different dioramas, but they tell the story from scripture of, of what was going on. More of the, uh, the larger uh, cages and, and then, you know, yeah, I thought I have to include one cat. I didn't know any, there were any cats on the ark, but it was a catastrophe. No? You know, and then they, you know, had, they came up with kind of some backstories with each of the individuals, because Noah is the only, uh, and his three sons are the only characters we have named. We don't know the name of Ham, Shem, and Japheth's wives, and we don't know Mrs. Noah's name. Of course, the old corny Sunday school joke is her name was Joan of Arc. I didn't make that up. So they gave her the name Zephora. Zephora, is it? Zephora, that's makeup, a makeup place, isn't it? Zephora? Zephora. I have no idea what you're saying. Thank you. Well, now that'll help me still not shop there. <clears throat> I, I get my makeup elsewhere. So they have different scenes, and I, I also didn't know this, but uh, all eight members of the uh, human beings that were on the ark, there's three levels to the ark encounter, and you'll find all eight of them uh, featured in, on each level. And uh, so it can be kind of a game for your kids. It's like find, find the character, but you know they show what their living quarters might have looked like what it would have looked like, uh, how they might have grown food even uh, while they were on board. I mean, they had a lot of time. There's Noah doing something with a bird. I think I remember that story somewhere. And then uh, they had a section, they partnered with uh, the, the, the Bible, is it the Bible Museum in DC? Museum of the Bible? No, this is the one in Washington, D.C. I think it's Museum of the Bible. Is that what it's called? You guys are super helpful. Thank you. Um, <laughs> anyway, and going through Scripture and how it's been preserved over the years, and they have some, you know, actual artifacts. Here they talked about uh, Ethiopia. I put that in there for some reason. Our church seems to have a few connections to uh, Ethiopia. But uh, some of the individuals, and let's face it, Ethiopia is mentioned in Scripture. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the missionaries, early missionaries, you can see there, AD 308 to 380. An Ethiopian uh, cross uh, there. There is a zoo there. They call it Ararat Ridge. <laughs> um, 
I went through these animals very quickly last week, so the cranes were nuts, and uh, they, I think they were showing off just a wee bit. And then the Creation Museum itself, um, which again, is, it's really well done, and it goes through, um, you know Ken Ham's The Seven Seas, starting with creation, uh, and it continues through, and that's kind of how the museum is, is laid out. <clears throat> And it shows, you know, some of the um, what happens when, you know, what happened when sin entered the world, and how it has affected our our modern world. So, as you walk through there, and you know, there's obviously scenes from uh, the book of Genesis. There's the first sea creation. You see the animals and Adam and Eve, and. And then we get into uh, Babylon and some of the things going on there. Um, I mentioned, uh, so this exhibit was, had just opened last year, but fearfully and wonderfully made. And I don't know how they did this, but it's phenomenal. It goes through uh, basically what the baby looks like from uh, shortly after conception and the different, the different stages. and these models are, the detail is, it's stunning. So there's 25 weeks, if you're curious. If you wanna look at what Nicole and Morgan's baby looks like, you pick which week, I don't know how many weeks you're at, but. 31. Oh, 31. Well, that's. Close to 33. Yeah, you're, you're, right, you're right in there. 38, 33, so that's pretty cute. <laughs> little Jun little Darren Jr. <laughs> I've been trying to suggest some names. I thought they were helpful. And then I did show <clears throat> this one last week. This thing's five feet tall. Uh, it's, it's very cool. I still wanna know how they got the hair on there. It's really remarkable. One of my favorite parts of that particular exhibit was at the end, it says true stories of, of hope. And uh, there's, you can see they have some brochures there uh, and they're showing testimony. So these would flash off and on and they'd change, but these are testimonies of individuals who had been adopted, um, who had uh, gone through foster care and their stories of hope and how uh, they were giving thanks that their mothers had chosen life. Um, and there's a video that talks about a, a woman, <clears throat> I mentioned this I think last week, but she shared at the gala, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know why I have no voice. But she had, uh, her mother had, had attempted an abortion or attempted to have an abortion and she was a twin, the twin did die, uh, but she survived uh, the abortion process. And, uh, but sharing her testimony and even reconciling with her birth mother. So it's pretty powerful stuff. So then there were a couple of slides I flashed through very quickly. So this is the Teresa Rivkin stuff that you, you know, I didn't know that those would bug you um, as much, but I did know, I do know how much butterflies bother you, so that's why we did. You can look away, Teresa, you ready? Yeah. But this was, this was fascinating. This was an exhibit that had, I mean, there were thousands of butterflies and bugs. And, uh, and Teresa, you'll be glad to hear, here, I'll, I'll get it off of that slide so that, there, you're good. All right. We don't want to traumatize you. <laughs> but uh, they're actually in the process of, of expanding, uh, I can't remember whether it's at the Creation Museum site or at the Ark Encounter site, but uh, some of you have probably been to the Pacific Science Center and the butterfly exhibit where they fly around and they land on you and it's, it's really cool. Uh, Teresa loves it, and um, but they're building something you know similar um, as part of the again one of the sites. Uh, 
Um, but it was really interesting, and they, you know, they had individuals there, experts sharing, you know, telling, and there was a whole group of kids that were touring at the time, and so they were explaining the different bugs and, and uh, their purpose in life. They do have a purpose. So Noyes. So at the Creation Museum, you can see you can see some of the uh, yeah you can see them some of the zip lines. So if you want to take a zip line over the pond there, um, the Ark Encounter has some very extensive zip lines, like three hour plus tours that you can take, and um, so those are you do pay for those, but it's still it's pretty reasonable. I didn't go on any of them. I really wanted to, but I just didn't have the time. Um, but um, I'll have to go on them at some point. But this is around the Creation Museum. They've added a lot of stuff over the years, this pond. And uh, there are no natural lakes in Kentucky. They're all man-made because water won't, it won't, it just soaks into the limestone. Um, but it makes for a beautiful environment. Lots of, if you're afraid of suspension bridges, I don't recommend walking on this. It wobbles a bit, but it was fun. And then this was, uh, we talked about this last week, but I did make a second stop at Waffle House. I had the uh, Texas, I don't know, it had egg and scrambled egg and bacon and on toast and it was delicious. Just having a moment right now. Um, that's where my brother and sister attend uh, church now, LaGrange Baptist Church. It's just a tiny church. Only about 500 people go there. Um, anyway, it's a very nice facility. That I couldn't, I didn't take any live pictures. I just didn't want to be rude, but I found that one online, and that uh, pretty well uh, is. Yeah, that seemed reflective of <laughs> what the church service looked like. The only difference is that in this picture, I noticed they don't have. Uh, where's my little, oh, there it is. So they've added up here, there's, sc there's screens on either side that, that show the PowerPoint. The old PowerPoint used to be on a screen that was up on the very top, and like you were having to look way up above the cross, but you know, it's a building built before any of, you know, PowerPoint. I don't know what they did back in the times of Christ with PowerPoint, but oh, and remember I was telling you about that little drum thing. There's there's their drum. They built this little looks like an aquarium almost. And maybe if he gets too loud, they fill it up with water. So anyway. Um, Huber Farms is actually in Indiana, and uh, so went on Monday with my uh, niece and my three great nephews. We went apple picking. And eating apples in Kentucky is like eating barbecue in Washington State. <laughs> Don't do it. But my little nephews, they were so excited about, you know, oh, Uncle Darren, taste this apple, it's so delicious. Like. <coughs> <laughs> Just didn't, no, it didn't work. I told my, uh, two of my nephews, I said, okay, now look cute, and that was the look I got. I did the same thing with these uh, carp, and um, do you see there's one catfish, you can tell which one the catfish is, and um, I felt no shame that I had catfish for lunch shortly after that. <clears throat> And then my youngest great nephew, <clears throat> Joseph, if we pan out, there's a large pumpkin ready to crush him. <laughs> he had no idea it was coming. Uh, this was my second meal at Mad Mike's. The guy suggested putting a fried egg on my hamburger. It was delicious. And the onion rings, fantastic. So I already booked for next year. There it is. Um, so now you know when to, I uh, won't be here next year. <laughs> wow. 
some excitement apparently from, from that. Anyway, so thank you again for, uh, for Morgan for filling in and for James and uh, Tony covered the Sunday evening service and, and everyone else. You know, it's really awesome that uh, I could be on vacation and although I missed you guys, I didn't stress at all. I knew everything would be, would run well. Uh, so thank you everyone. Thank you by the way too, I, I'm not always great at thanking people, but uh, for all of the, well, let's see, my birthday was in September, so thank you for the birthday cards and wishes and all that, and uh, for uh, pastor appreciation, um, for the cards and gifts, and uh, still have not, I'm waiting for the BMW. <clears throat> <clears throat> Yeah, I might be waiting a while, and that's okay. I'm, I'm fine with my Honda. Um, but appreciate your guys' support and uh, enabling me to go to that conference and, and uh, learning a lot and will continue to learn a lot. And uh, of course, then our own study on Genesis, uh, we'll pick that up uh, next week. Next week, by the way, is the National Day of Prayer, International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. So we will make mention of that. We do support Voice of the Martyrs uh, as one of our outreaches. And uh, so we'll definitely uh, highlight some of that. But. Um, to tie this all together, <clears throat> Answers in Genesis, their whole um, mission is to make sure that people know exactly what the book of Genesis says, specifically the first 11 chapters. And we've talked about it many times because every, every social issue, every social ill that we face today is dealt with in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And so it is important that we have a good understanding of what, what is said there and that we don't compromise. It's, it's been, unfortunately, it's, uh, it was one thing for scientists to give up on the Bible, but for the church to give up on the Bible, that's horrific. And so any of the issues, why I don't, this is not a, a Christian treatment of the life of John Marshall Harlan. I don't know whether he was a man of faith or not. I have a feeling he was because, you know, most of the abolitionists were Christians because they understood what God's plan was and they understood that God created each of us distinctly with a unique purpose with value um, and he's the one who gives us value so it's not a surprise that when when people follow biblical principles society thrives and benefits and we are seeing uh, the the disintegration of safety and freedom and all sorts of things, we see it happening, unfolding before our eyes, and it's directly related to the lack of, of following God's word, the lack of understanding his principles. And so people don't respect each other, and some people see certain ethnic groups as being superior or inferior, and that's not what God's word says. So. I, I know I'm preaching to the choir, um, but since we are the choir, then back to Michael Ferris, we're the ones who are supposed to sing that song. And let's sing it well, let's sing it boldly. Here's the beautiful thing about proclaiming the gospel, about proclaiming God's word. It has nothing to do with your musical ability. Some of you should not be in front of a microphone. Um, Although maybe, you, maybe your singing voice is such that it could help um, deter criminal behavior. What I mean by that <laughs> is there are businesses, you may have heard of this, in fact I was walking by one uh, in the Belltown area of downtown Seattle just the other day, 
and they were playing classical, excuse me, they were blaring classical music outside, uh, you know, so that it would deter people from loitering and from, and there was not a single person camped out on that sidewalk. Now, if you find a homeless person who enjoys Beethoven, then, okay, you're out of luck, but um, do you remember, was this during the Reagan administration when the whole Nicaragua situation went on with uh, Noriega and uh, the dictator down there? But the uh, U.S. military was blaring uh, rock music uh, over the border just to annoy them. Apparently it worked. Take that, Nicaragua. All right, um, I don't know where I was going with that, except that uh, uh, this, this is vital stuff, uh, learning God's word, learning it well. So what can you do individually? Well, first of all, crack this thing open. Some of you have very disciplined spiritual lives and are very good at having a, a set time where you read God's word, where you talk to him through prayer. Uh, some of you may struggle with that. Uh, don't give up if you struggle with that. You know, my suggestion is, you know, after you get the eye croutons out and all of the rest of it in the morning when you first wake up and, you know, and you get that nasty taste out of your mouth, um, crack open God's word. Start your day by reading God's word. Take time, time out. And if you keep thinking, well, I don't have time because I'm, you know, I'm running late for work or school or, or whatever, that is just not a good excuse. Make time. I guarantee if you commit to, maybe just commit to a week, start off with that. It's like, you know, Lord, for one week, I'm going to do this. I'm going to read your word, even if it's just a minute. I would recommend longer, but um, I guarantee your week will go better. I guarantee, I don't mean that it will go better in the sense of everything will be perfect, but when problems crop up, you'll be able to handle them in a much more effective way, in a much more uh, godly way. Uh, read his word. You will never go wrong by reading his word. Um, talk to him. Pray to him. Uh, keep a journal. Some of you journal, and that is an amazing way to uh, process your thoughts, but also look back on it and see how God has been faithful to you. You know, write down prayer requests. Some of you do this where you, you know, write down three or five things at the end of the day, you know, that you can be thankful for. And, and even if it's, the, if, if you just say, I'm thankful for life, why not be thankful for that? And then give God thanks for it. Give him the praise. Give him the glory. It'll make a huge difference in your life. So let's close. Father, thank you for all that you've done for us. And thank you for this morning. A little bit of a disjointed potpourri of insanity. But um, Lord, the underlying message is that your word is true. Your word is reliable. Your word is vital to our spiritual lives, but it's, it's vital to our physical lives as well because it, it brings us life on so many different levels. Help us to have boldness as we proclaim truth to those who are around us. Thank you for the opportunities that you will give us. We've had prayer requests this morning from, from Madeline's prayer about a coworker and you know, there's another great example of, of knowing the truth and proclaiming the truth. And, and God, you haven't called all of us to be Bible scholars, but you do want us to be scholars of the Bible. You want us to study your word and utilize what we know. Help us to continue to, to hunger for knowledge, for wisdom. Help us to continue to be curious, to want to know uh, the answers to the questions that are out there. Help us to seek truth from reliable uh, sources, from individuals that we know uh, are trustworthy. But ultimately, Lord, it has to be compared to your word. 
Help us to test the spirits, as John said, we're, we are to do that, test the spirits so we know what is the spirit of error and what is the spirit of truth. Thank you for loving us always, for being with us always. Continue to guide us this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.